Talking now a little bit about the liturgy. Liturgy means specifically, technically, a work for God. A work for God. Or we perhaps could, could put it this way. It's ministering to the Lord. Ministering to the Lord. In practical terms, the liturgy refers to the way we worship God. The way we worship God. And how we celebrate his mysteries. His mysteries. Remember, of course, what a mystery is. A mystery is not something we can't understand. Or a mystery is not a word we use for something we can't explain. You know, we believe it, but we can't explain it, so it's a mystery, so you've got to believe it. It's not that. That's not what mystery is. Mystery is a truth that is so deep and profound that it requires revelation. And we can plumb the depths of the mysteries of God, probably not to the very bottom. We probably can't understand the whole thing perfectly, but we can understand a lot about the mysteries of God. The sacrifice of the cross is a mystery. The sacrifice of the, of the Eucharist is a mystery. In fact, it's the same mystery. We celebrate. We can understand a lot of that. It needs to be revealed to us. We need to be taught. Who does the teaching? The Holy Spirit does the teaching. Holy Spirit is the teacher. Holy Spirit teaches the church. You and I are the church. The instruments within the church simply vocalize the teachings of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, that's what a mystery is. So we celebrate his mysteries. And liturgy, in practical terms, is simply the way we do it. That's the way we do it. And there's a certain ritual involved, right? A certain ritual involved. Ritual is a, is a, a series of regulations or directions as to how to celebrate the liturgy. That's the ritual. In, in common English or in regular English, we're probably more used to thinking of ritual in terms of what a lot of people call it, dead ritual. Well, ritual doesn't have to be dead. Ritual can be very much alive. Okay? And we, we do a lot of ritual anyway. Quite apart from what we do religiously, there's ritual all over the place in, in our land, in our, in our society, in our culture, and all that. We have parades. That's ritual. Presentations of, the, let's say, the Order of Canada or something. Uh, royal occasions and so on. The queen comes to visit. Uh, garb for, for people. The speaker of the house garbs in a certain way. The judges in certain courts and so on put on gowns and so on, that kind of stuff. This is ritual. The robes of office, the chains of office, the chain of the mayor of Ottawa. That, that's, rich, that's all part of it. Uniforms. Uniforms of police, army, navy, air force. This is all part of ritual sort of thing. So we're familiar with ritual. When it comes to religious ritual, we shouldn't be put off by that. It is, let's see, ritual is normal. It is normal to, to, to wave a flag. That's normal. It is normal to ritualize the things we do. If they're important. If they're important. And uh, if the things we do ministering to God are important, and I guess they are, then it is, it is fitting that we ritualize these things. And that's what we do. And that's what, that's what the liturgy becomes. Anyway, there you go. Daily parliament. You've seen the, uh, the uh, news eh, with the parliamentarians, the members coming in a little late. As soon as they come in, they, they bow to the chair, and then they take their place. That's almost the same as in church, isn't it? There's a reverence to the speaker. So there's a reverence here to the Blessed Sacrament. The... Uh, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, the proper reverence is, is genuflection. That's bending the knee to the floor. If you can manage it. You know, if it's not too painful and all that kind of thing. That's the right knee, by the way. Just to be proper sort of thing. If your left knee is more flexible, fine. I'm sure the Lord doesn't mind a lot about that. And so on. The liturgy of the Lord, the liturgy of the Lord, is reflected in Scripture. If you checked Acts 13.1, it is we're told that in Antioch, in Antioch, while they were celebrating the liturgy of the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, I want Barnabas and Saul set aside for a special work 
that I have in mind. During the liturgy of the Lord. Now, we, as Catholics, we can relate to that easily. But of course, what they were doing was celebrating the Eucharist. That's the liturgy. The liturgy of the Lord, celebrating that. And the Holy Spirit spoke. Went over that before. How does the Holy Spirit speak? By a, uh, a voice coming through the, the window? No. But rather through one of the members of the assembly. Who will say, I think God wants us to do this, that, or the other thing. Or sometimes even in the first person, I, the Lord, your God, speak to you now and tell you what I want, kind of thing, and so on. The breaking of the bread that's referred to in the, in the early church in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2, verse 42, and other places, the breaking of the bread is what we call the Eucharist. Eucharist itself means thanksgiving, giving thanks. There are many documents of the early church as well that refer and describe the liturgy of the Lord in such a way that you would be amazed because it's identical really it's identical in form to what we do now you know the gifts are brought to the altar the prayer is said the readings are done first and all that kind of thing there's a, an early document called the Didache which I think is uh, basically the teaching of the twelve apostles as it's called in other places it describes that the Eucharist or the Mass in virtually the same terms, the same way as we celebrate it today. And that's, that's a, to the early part of the second century. Amazing. Like, you know, sometimes we want to like, maybe they like the stuff the Catholic Church teaches is not right or some of that kind of stuff. Because the Bible says this or the Bible says that and so on. This scripture, this verse, says that verse, the other verse. We could put verses of scripture together to make different sounding things completely. But to me, it's, it's not so that like, like we can find verses of scripture that seem to, to confront those verses of scripture. That kind of battle can go on forever. But rather, for me, the thing that's so telling is, well, what did the earliest Christians do? How did they understand it? And when we search that out, and there are plenty of documents to search out, when we search that out, we find that the earliest Christians did a lot of the things that we are quite familiar with, that perhaps are not directly, as much as directly as we'd like them to be, uh, spelled out in, in sacred scripture. The Eucharist is a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the cross. Jesus came to take our sins upon himself. He took it all on. He became sin for us, which St. Paul writes as well. Father Bill is favor, uh, is, uh, likes to quote that again and again. He became sin for us. He took it all on. He snatched up the burden, as St. Paul writes, and nailed it to the cross. And he suffered the consequences of all the sin of all mankind. He is divine. He's the divine Son of God. Not just an ordinary man. A man like us in all things but sin, but not just a man. He's the divine Son of God. And he took the whole thing on, and he suffered its consequence. The consequences of sin are suffering and death. He suffered, he died. Our sins, in other words, killed him. Killed him. He died early, by the way, on the cross, didn't he? He died before it was expected that he would die. Why did that happen? My theory is he died of a broken heart. He died of a broken heart because he could see, the Father allowed him to see down through the centuries, how many, many people, although he poured out his life for them, shed his blood for them, cried tears for them, desired them with a burning furnace of love in his heart, still, a lot of people would say, thank you, but no thanks. And simply turn their backs on him and walked away. I mean, how, how heartbreaking can that be? If you have ever loved someone who threw it back in your face, you know what it, a little bit of what it's like. It must, must have been like for Jesus, a little bit. Unrequited love is the most painful experience, I would think. One of the most painful experiences of all human life, and so on. But anyway, he died. It's a sacrifice of the cross. But you see, the death that he underwent did not, was not the end of the line. 
Because through the power of the Holy Spirit on the third day, at the voice of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. So that all those things that our sins effect, suffering and death, are defeated. They're all defeated. He took it on. He conquered it. He came back to life. He lives now. And so on. Now that's what we celebrate at the Eucharist. We come together around <clears throat> the altar. Looks like a table. It is a table. It's a special table. It's a religious table. A holy table. This little altar in the front, the larger altar at the back. They're both altars, right? I think I mentioned one time there, like this whole area around here, this is the sanctuary of the church. This is the nave of the church, right? You're sitting in the nave. The sanctuary is up. It's the raised platform. The whole thing is the sanctuary. The altar is just the table, the other table. Those are the altars. You know, it's just the uh, go home after Mass on Sunday and say, there are, oh, there are six priests on the altar today. Boy, it doesn't look that big, does it? Six big guys all up there. Anyway, you know what I mean. So often we, we call the altar the whole sanctuary. The whole sanctuary is not the altar. It's a sanctuary. All right. There you go. Having made that point again. Look at that, eh? So, sacrifice of the cross, sacrifice of the mass. Sometimes people say, well, you're not supposed to multiply sacrifices. The scripture says, of course, though. We know that. We are not multiplying sacrifices. We are simply making present once again and again and again the one sacrifice of the cross. That's what we're doing. In obedience to what Jesus said, bread, wine, my body, my blood, do it. Do it in memory of me. That's what we're doing. We do it. We make it present once again. Here then is the sacrifice of the cross celebrated on the altar in a clean way without all the blood of the cross, in a clean way. As the prophet Malachi said, is it 3.11 or something? I think I've... 1.11, thank you, there it is right there, see? From the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, there will be a clean offering offered to my name. Down through the... Well, what is that? Well, that's what it is. That's the clean offering. That's the... in the form of bread and wine. Bread and wine. Um, Jesus said to do it. Make present the cross again and again and offer it to the Father. That's why the, the pivotal point of the celebration of the Eucharist is the offering of the body and blood of Christ to the Father. That's done at what's called the doxology. Through him, with him, in him. The answer that the people give, the answer that you give to that offering of Jesus to the Father is the most important participation that you can have in the Eucharist. That amen is the important answer, the important statement, the important profession of God's people in church. That's it. So it's terribly unfitting. It doesn't, doesn't make sense at all. Say, Through him, with him, in him, the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever, men. Now and forever. Everybody answers. Mm. Amen? Oh, no, no, you can't do it like that. That's no good. I won't do. We have to make a big fuss over that. Well, we try to do that here. If you've come to Mass here, you know, we try to make a big fuss over it here. We take time. Amen, 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 amen. Why? Because that's the important, the most important part of the Mass. That's what we're doing. We are offering the sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood to the Father. And that's the symbol. The, 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 the celebrant will raise it up. We're offering it to the Father. Understand? And like that, that's, that represents that we've uh, united ourselves. We've identified ourselves with the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. We've identified with it. You know, the little drop of water that goes into the, the cup of wine in the beginning? You know, just at the... The, the gifts at the altar there before that, you know, that little drop of water, bing, into the cup of wine, becomes wine. The drop of water represents you and me. We just place ourselves 
in the sacrifice, everything I am, everything I have, everything I do, think, etc., etc., etc. That goes in there. That gets turned into the body and blood of Christ and offered to the Father. That's an exalted celebration, absolutely exalted. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's hard to find words that describe what the Eucharist, what the Mass really is. It really is. It's, it's hard to find words to describe it. Anyway, the Mass, the Eucharist, is a sacrifice, just as Jesus' sacrifice of the cross, sacrifice of the altar. But it is also, it is also what he did the day before, the night before he offered his life on the cross. It's a meal. It's a Paschal meal, recalling the great works of God on behalf of his people, the bread, the wine. And, of course, it's, it looks like a meal, too, doesn't it? The table. And people come up to participate. That's Holy Communion. It is both a sacrifice and a meal. But it is both. It's not as though if you face the people, it looks like a meal. If you face the wall, it looks like a sacrifice. I don't follow that at all. It is both. No matter which way we face. We could face to the side. And be like, it's still a meal and a sacrifice. Both. Both. And could be done with great dignity and great joy and great reverence and great everything else and so on. Just one last little thing about the, the kind of sacrifice that, that Jesus offered and tells us to offer. The bread and the wine. A, a character out of the Old Testament who appeared right in the very beginning, the first book in Genesis does this little thing and disappears. He's never heard from again. He's referred to twice later on, one in one of the Psalms and once in the, in the letter to the Hebrews. A character by the name of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, who is the prince of Salem, wherever that was. I'm not sure where that is. Or it could be the prince of Shalom, prince of peace. Melchizedek comes and he brings bread and wine to Abraham. Here it is, in Genesis 14, I found it. I found it way back here. Just a few lines, just a very few lines, but listen to what it says. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And being a priest of God Most High, he blessed Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, the creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivers your foes into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Melchizedek, who was he? Who was he? But he's very significant, because in, in the, whatever psalm that is, I forget which, perhaps I have it written here somewhere, perhaps I don't. Perhaps I do, Psalm 110. Verse 4, because the one who was to come would be called a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And in Hebrews 3, Hebrews rather 6.20, Jesus specifically is called a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, what does that mean? It means he offered a sacrifice of bread and wine. Bread and wine. He did that at the, at the Last Supper, and he did it in the, uh, the physical way on the cross the next day. And then Abraham gives this fellow Melchizedek a tenth. Uh, I hate to point out that that, of course, is a tithe. Ten percent of everything he had he gave to Melchizedek, who was a priest. God bless the scriptures and everything, you know. I think we need to support the priesthood a little more than, than we do these days. But anyway, I, you know, if I don't want to make a big point of that or anything like that. You can take that to prayer and so on. But that's the, uh, that, that tithe or that tenth is reserved to, to priests, to the priesthood. So Melchizedek was a priest, Abraham gave him the tenth and so on. So Abraham is quite old, and yet the Lord has got through to him to say that he wants him to go forward, just leave your town, and head west. I have a place I want to lead you to, a land flowing with milk and honey and so on. And I want you to settle there. Your descendants will be like the stars in the heavens, like the sands on the shores of the sea. 
And Abraham, of course, is completely nonplussed at the idea that he would even have one child, let alone descendants to number in the, in the millions. But, sure enough, his wife bears him a child. And it just starts off, this becomes the Jewish race. As numerous as the stars in the heavens and the sands on the shores of the sea, and so on. So Abraham heads out. He leaves his home. And I love the, the line in Hebrews. I don't think I marked this one out. It's not too far from that particular spot where the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, Abraham left his home without knowing where he was going. That's perfect. Can you imagine? Would you do that? I mean, bad enough being that old and having to move. But simply to move and just really not know where you were going. What an incredible faith that took. Amazing. Eh? It's just simply amazing. I, my mouth just falls open when I see that or hear that. Then in the, when Jesus came to that night before he died and he said, I've longed to, to eat this meal with you with Longing I have longed, as the, apparently, literally, the, the language, the Aramaic of the day had it. I have longed tremendously to eat this meal with you. He took bread, he took wine, and he said, this is my body, this is my blood, making pretty clear connection between that action and those words and the words he had spoken that are quoted and told all about in the whole chapter of John, chapter 6. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. On that occasion, people who had been walking with him for some time as his faithful disciples got up and walked away. Said, that's too tough. We can't swallow that kind of stuff. That's ridiculous. We're out of here. That was the occasion on which Jesus turned to Peter and said, are you going to go away too? And Peter came up with his finest line, according to my observation and conclusion when we said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And they stuck with him. And now here it is, it's months later, a year later, whatever, and Jesus is taking bread and taking wine and saying, this is my body and this is my blood. Can you see the, the gentleman around the table then going, oh, yeah. Remember what I remember? You remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Mass, the Eucharist, what we celebrate, the mysteries of God, the principal mystery of the Lord that we celebrate together in liturgical way, according to a ritual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, St. Paul writes... Is not the cup of blessing that we bless a sharing in the very blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians, St. Paul writes, I find it difficult to understand why a lot of people have problems in understanding why the Church of Rome, the Catholic Church, or the Orthodox churches, which teach basically the same thing, that the presence of Jesus in the sacrament, in the Eucharist, is real. It is real. There are so many scriptural references. In addition to that, there is the practice and the teaching of the early church. Right at the beginning they did that. Right at the turn of the first century, halfway through, second century, on down. There's no break in it. It just kept going. Plus, as I say, the scriptural references as well. I find it very difficult to understand why people have a problem with it. But I'm sure we could get a, a stirring discussion going with someone who has really studied it and believes something different. It's a real present and a presence and a real sacrifice. In uh, Protestant circles, it is only a symbolic presence and not a sacrifice at all. The, the history, the recent history, or some references of the recent history, of what was called, became known as the liturgical movement. As I said at the Council of Trent, the Mass, 
the Eucharist, the form of it, the liturgy was frozen. Nothing was to be changed. It was to be said, read, done, celebrated, whatever, in the same way every time. Now, when I was ordained, that's the way I did it. I don't understand the, the hankering to get back to that. I don't understand that either. I don't understand that. Because my recollection of it is that it was a sacred performance, in a sense, with the priest as the leading character and some supporting cast. There might have been another fellow come out to give the homily or sermon, as we call it in those days. And then, of course, there were the servers. That was the supporting cast. And it was played out on a raised platform called the sanctuary, much like a stage. And the audience was down like this in the pews, in the rows, in, on the benches, as it were, spectators. Spectators of the, the performance. Now that, of course, is not ideal of what the Eucharist is supposed to be. And that, I mean, if we, we'd have talked to, you know, men who were priests in those days and talked to me about it, that's not the way we saw it either. But that's the way it looked. And that's the way it came down. That's the way it came off. Because the people took no part in it whatsoever in most places. No part at all. They were simply, as Pope Pius X called them, silent spectators who do not participate in the Eucharistic liturgy, the Eucharistic sacrifice. They don't participate in it. They simply watch it. Or, if they're a little more advanced, they read it in their own language as the priest says it in Latin. You know? And if they're really into it, they'll respond in Latin to the things that the altar boys have been doing for, for decades in their place. Introivo ad altare dei, says the priest to begin. Ad deum quilatificat juventutum meam says, or say, the boys. You know? Fine, what does it mean? I go to the altar of God, to the God who gives joy to my youth. So on. Which is fine. I mean, it's all very exalted and everything. But the problem was, most of us who were involved in it didn't know what we were saying. Now, I understood that part of it. But there were a number of the prayers through the rest of the, of the celebration. Quite, quite frankly, I didn't understand them. Like, I knew what they were because I'd go back and read them in English, and I knew that. But as I was saying them, I didn't know what I was saying. And, of course, the boys didn't have a clue. <laughs> and any of the people who were responding to, if they followed, you know, on both sides of the page, they could tell what was happening and so on. So that's the way it was. And Pius X is credited with being the founder of what became known in this century as the liturgical movement. He said his most famous line, I'll never forget, I heard this first in the seminary, and I thought, that's it. That's the secret. That's the answer to bringing our people alive. I, uh, I guess early, from my earliest days, before I ever heard of the liturgical movement, or heard of anything, I thought, my goodness, we are quiet in church. I, I can't tell you how I envied the Protestant people who went to church and sang. Tunes that were easy to sing. And how we went to church and didn't, couldn't do much singing. Well, we didn't sing anyway. And some of the tunes are pretty hard to sing. Some of the chant, the plain chant, you know. It would rise and fall. It's nice to listen to. It's very soothing. You can doze right out to it. That's the problem. <laughs> it can be looked upon as very reverent. I suppose it could. But anyway, that kind of thing. When I went to the seminary first, I was so thrilled to stand there the first night or the first time we all got up and sang a hymn, and actually a Catholic hymn from a Catholic hymn book all together, and the roof blew off. Everybody's singing. This is incredible. I thought that was marvelous. That this is the way it's supposed to be in our churches. When I was ordained, I said, I'll get the people singing. Yes, sirree. Pius X said, here's the quote first, said this, the liturgy, the, or rather, the in indispensable source of the true Christian spirit 
Now those are fairly important words. The indispensable, we can't do without it, source of the true Christian spirit is the active, active participation in the liturgy of the church by the laity. That's where they will get the true Christian spirit. That, in other words, I interpreted, will bring them alive. Will bring them alive as they come to church. Is if they participate actively. So there you go. I'm ordained. People will now, when I'm around, participate actively in this celebration. So I would get up and talk about singing. Everybody will sing. Everybody sing in this church simple songs to honor the Lord. Would you withhold your voice from God? <laughs> Guilt tripping, you know, as I say. Sometimes it can get done what you want done. Uh, and some people, of course, would say, well, I can't sing. I say, nonsense. If you can talk, you can sing. If you can talk, you can sing at least one note. Sing it. Use the words and sing the one note you've got. Don't worry about it. It will all make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So I was selling, as I was selling active participation and starting with the, the singing of the hymns. I didn't get to first base. The people sat there, just like Bernie there, with his arms folded. People sat there with jaws set, as much as to say, I will not sing. <laughs> you can't make me sing. Which was true. And they didn't sing. Didn't sing. Didn't make one bit of difference. Not one bit of difference. Let's all sing now. Zzz. And me, you know, with a fairly loud voice, if I get myself at a microphone, I can make a lot of noise. Singing at the top of my voice. And nobody else with me at all. So active participation was not easy to achieve. I said, what's the matter with this? I figure this whole thing out. At any rate, there were great scholars that took up the cause of the liturgical movement uh, in France and Germany and later in the United States and England and uh, developed a whole theology and history of the liturgy. And when I was in the seminary, I bought it 100%. I thought, this has got to be it. I became fascinated with the liturgy. Fascinated. I never became a liturgist, by the way. But I became fascinated with the liturgy. With the liturgy. So important. I went to conferences. I remember going to St. Louis to a conference in 1957. 1957. In the summer of 57, in the Kiel Auditorium, which held 18,000 people, and filled to the rafters, singing all together. And they were all singing. Because they were all keen, see, like me, about the liturgical revival in the church. And a pastor from St. Louis, a famous man, who composed a hymn actually that we sing here, To Jesus Christ, Our Sovereign King. He composed that. Monsignor, somebody, Hellregal. <coughs> Monsignor Hellregal. Marvelous. We gave the homily. Terrific and so on. What, what an uplifting you know, experience that was. It was fantastic. And yet, this did not filter to our churches at all. I went to another one in Chicago the following year. It was the same. I read the periodicals, read everything I could get my hands on. When the Vatican Council started a few years later, just a few years later, 1962, the schema or the document on the liturgy was the first one that the Council Fathers took up. I was amazed. I wonder what they'll do with it. Well, what they did with it was accept the principal teachings of the liturgical movement from beginning to end. I was ecstatic. Ecstatic! And what we were going to be allowed to do was to introduce the language of the people. Now we can understand some of it. And eventually all of the, the language came into English. So well, that's all it's required. As long as people understand it, they will participate and the church will come alive. Didn't happen. I didn't do it either. I went through a lot of time of puzzle and, and wonder and, and search around that time. And the new rite was produced, the Novus Ordo, the new order, new way 
of celebrating the liturgy by, by Pope Paul VI. Some of it was in Latin, eventually fell out of Latin. Some of the Gregorian chant was retained, eventually that was uh, dumped as well. Some of the music that we sang in the early days of the English liturgy, if you like, some of the music was terrible, absolutely awful. But we sang it with gusto because it was in English. We understood it. But it was just awful. We used secular tunes and put religious words to them. I just forget some of the tunes. I'm trying to forget them, so that's probably why I don't remember them. There followed a period in some places of indiscriminate experimentation. It's like every celebrant at some point eventually pretty well got to do his own thing. Now that's exaggerating a bit. But there was an awful lot of funny stuff going on in the liturgy. You know, the, the well, I won't get into all that. Mass, balloon masses and clown masses and, and animal masses, you know, little doggies coming up the middle aisle, middle aisle and so on. Symbolizing something. Until, of course, a lot of people got very, very fed up. Too many times in too many places, the, the mass became the preserve of the celebrant, his priorities and his style. Something he was never meant to be. The priest is not supposed to be an actor up there. He's not supposed to steal the show. He's supposed to lead the people into worship as best he can. It's difficult not to sort of be noticed when you're saying Mass, but it's, it's important that the priest not sort of highlight himself. Maybe it's okay in the homily to make fun of himself once in a while, but not at the altar. You know what I mean? There's a Latin saying that, uh, that tells us a lot, if we understand it. This is it, lex orandi, lex credendi. Orandi refers to praying and credendi to believing. The way you pray will influence the way you believe. And as some of these prayers were being made up, some of the vital teachings of the church were getting watered down in the praying. The way you pray becomes eventually the way you believe. And this is what happened. Belief in the Eucharist itself began to diminish. There became a movement to, to redo the churches. You'll, perhaps some of you remember that. When the new churches were built, the tabernacle, with the, the presence of Jesus held in the tabernacle, the tabernacle was, was quite often moved. And not often to a very, very prominent place. Some, some churches have it over there. Some other churches way over there. Others in a private room at the back. Some places, I have walked by the tabernacle without knowing I was walking by it. It's right in the wall, on the side aisle. It's sort of cut into the wall and walking by. The, you know, and people have lost the sense of the actual presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Now, five years ago, whatever years ago, we, we started to, to examine the possibilities of, of redoing some of the, the church. We moved the, the, some of the organ to the front and so on, and the singers, lead singers up here and all that sort of thing. And there was a fair bit of suggestion that we take the tabernacle and move it somewhere. But uh, a number of us who uh, carried enough weight uh, said, no, we think we'll leave it where it is. Uh, because it speaks a it speaks a, a an important an important truth. The belief in the real presence has suffered as tabernacles, I guess, have got shifted around. The people of God of Vatican II say in Vatican II the, the church was called the people of God, almost became in some places at some times the people who are now God themselves. In some churches, perhaps you are being taught, or you will be taught, and I've heard, in some churches we must look for the presence of Christ, not so much in the elements that we take to the altar, bread and wine, but in the people. This is where we find Christ, in the people. If you have opened your heart to the Lord and invited him in, of course he's there, he's with you. If you haven't done that, or you've kicked him out with serious sin, then he's not there. We can't assume that, you know. 
And the celebration seems to revolve more around us than around him. And that has, that has done incredible harm to what we believe. Um, if, we, if we think that that's where the, the, the priest, the, the Jesus rather, is in the congregation, not so much in the elements, eventually he won't be in the elements at all, is what we'll believe. So we don't care much about the elements. Not really, we become people who don't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the elements. And this takes us away from the Catholic traditional belief over the centuries right from the very beginning. And this has happened in the church, and so on. In a parish in this town, in a parish in this, this city, uh, one young lady that I know, I just forget who it was, but I, I know at the time I knew her, said that she had gone to her local parish rectory to request that they have adoration every Friday or every Sunday for three hours in the church, that the Blessed Sacrament be exposed, as we have downstairs in the Adoration Chapel, for three hours on a day, one day a week, and was told by the parish assistant, who's not a priest, not a religious sister, but just like a pastoral assistant, was told, we can't do that. That would be idolatry. Well, that's heresy. That's out-and-out out heresy to say that. Now, that's where we've got to. I've never heard the pastor of the parish say anything like that, but this is going on. This is being said under his nose, I guess, or whatever. Anyway, this is where we have got to. This, a lot of this has come, to, has come into play because the liturgy has been abused. Has been abused. Those who want the restoration of the Latin rite completely and want to do away with the Novus Ordo, say that you can't have a celebration of dignity and reverence with the, with the Novus Ordo. Well, that's not true. That's not true either. I think we celebrate here with dignity and reverence, but we also make some noise. But that's something we're supposed to do too. In one of the articles I was referring to, the traditional Catholic spirituality is characterized by a hush and reverence. Well, sure, there's place for hush, reverence, and quiet in Catholic spirituality and liturgy, of course. But there's also place for noise. Look at the Psalms, for heaven's sake. All you people, Psalm 47, clap your hands. Shout to God with cries of joy. Shout to God. Sing a new song. Sing, you people. Stand before the Lord. Raise your hands on high in praise of God. The Psalms say all these things. And there's no point in saying, well, yeah, but there were the Old Testament. That was for the Jews. Well, fine. But they're also, by the church, brought into the, the, the liturgy of the Mass. We say these. You know, like sometimes, instead of singing a hymn, we'll, we'll say the entrance verse together, and it'll be Psalm 47. All you people clap your hands. Let's all say the entrance uh, antiphon together, please, as we uh, come to the altar. All you people clap your hands. Shout to God with cries of joy. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Like, the, in order to celebrate, we have to do it in a human way. Somebody who can't put a little oomph into the celebration, I would say, is emotionally immature. How's that? For sort of a challenge, you know? You can't make a little noise at Mass? Why not? Well, anyway, we're encouraged to do that. Sure, there's got to be hush. There's an interesting line, by the way, in the, in the book, book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. It says, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. That's not much silence. Presumably in heaven... There will be a lot of praise of God. It'll be the first thing. When, when Jesus taught us how to pray, that was the first thing he said to do. Hallowed be thy name. May your name be holy. Held holy. Told holy. Praise. Lift it up. If that's what we're going to be doing in heaven, we might as well start practicing now. Get good at it. I hate to have to go to, to elementary lessons in heaven for how to praise God. You know, 
I would hope I would be beyond that stage a bit. But if you want to start all over there, fine, fine. Keep quiet in church. Good enough. The one fellow said to me one time, I can't see all this noise in church. He says, can you imagine the Blessed Mother shouting in praise of God and waving her hands wildly in the air? I said, yes, I can. She was Jewish, don't forget. <laughs> she was not liturgically emotionally immature. That's the way they prayed together. Alone, they were very quiet. When I pray alone, I'm very quiet. I'll make a peep. When I pray with other people, then I make some noise. Sure, she did that, of course. She waved her hands up like that. She clapped them around with everybody else. Does that destroy this, this picture of the Blessed Mother we have? Is this demure, eyes down? That's not her. That's not our Blessed Mother. She was a, a full of life woman. She was everything woman can be, absolutely. And when she got to praising God, she did it the way it was done by her people.